Hey everyone, it's Natalie, also known as Nitty Natty. Welcome to a not podcast today. Today we're going to be catching up on all of the questions that are in the Ravelry Ask Me thread. I will explain more about that <laughs> in just a second. But a few things before we get started on the questions. So one, I feel like because it is podcast day and a regular podcast will be back next week. I have to tell you about like the weather and stuff. So it has been chilly, cold. I had my puffy jacket out until like today. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it was nice. It was in the sixties and sunny and wonderful, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to complain about the time change It is seriously the worst. I've been dreading it for over a month now. I said I was going to order one of those like, uh, sad lights or happy lights, I guess, for seasonal affective disorder. And I still haven't, even though I plan to do it forever ago. And now we're here and the days are going to get shorter until December 21st and then they'll get longer again. Um, but anyway, it's 540 and it's pitch black dark out. And this is one of, I'm sure, many things that I will be filming at night. So I've got all my equipment, my old, I say old because used to, this is kicking it way back to the beginning of the Love and Stitches podcast. I would have to rush home from work um, in the later and early months of the year. So like October through February, I guess. <sighs> Somebody's being so loud with their car, but I would have to rush home from work because I didn't have any lighting equipment and I needed to film the, film the podcast and I would have to sit in front of the window and the sun would just set and it was so frustrating and it made me so not a kind person because I just like got home and I was like, I have to get set up and I have to do this. <laughs> now I have all my lighting and I used, I almost got rid of it actually or put it in storage because I wasn't using it because I can film during the day now because this is my full-time job, but I'm glad I have it here at my convenience because Hello, I need it. <laughs> so anyway, that's the bad news is that the days are shorter. I mean, I guess they start earlier, but I'm not starting earlier. The good news, there's a small bit of good news is I can actually put on my little fairy lights and you can see them. I guess I didn't get them very, <laughs> very much in the frame, but I, I really do enjoy my little twinkly lights that I got at Target many, many years ago. Okay, so we're not having a podcast this week, one, because I wanna catch up on questions, but also because I've been in sort of a knitting funk um, since I finished Shellography, um, and I haven't really been able to focus on any particular project. Um, I haven't shown Shellography on the podcast yet, so you haven't missed that, but I'm just having like a weird transitional time with my knitting right now, and I need to get that sorted out and get some things finished and sorted and before I film a podcast again. And we had an event on Sunday, the um, Fall Garment Make Along Celebration to wrap that up. So I've already had a video earlier this week. So I was like, you know what? This will be fine. We'll wrap up all the questions and do that instead of a podcast episode. Um, I've got 17 questions to answer today. I think the earliest one was from October 9th. So that's how behind I am. <laughs> um, but we're also going to discontinue the ask me portion of the podcast. So this is it. I've closed the thread. You can no longer add to the ask me Ravelry thread. Um, but I'm going to finish out by answering all the questions that are on there in this video today. And then we are going to be adding one to two new segments to the podcast to replace the ask me part. I one wanted to change it because I'm getting so behind on questions. And two, I was just looking for something fresh to do. I've been doing the podcast now for almost two years, or is it three? I think it's two. <laughs> Wait. Okay, well, I'm not gonna try to do that math. It's dark outside. Um, but anyway, I have been doing the podcast for over 100 episodes, over 120 episodes. And I'm like, you know what? It's time to try something new. So I have a ton of great suggestions from y'all on Instagram. I asked what you would like to see and I haven't even nailed it down yet because I just asked today. So it'll be a surprise when the podcast comes around next week. And I will share with you what we are going to do in lieu of the Ask Me portion. Um, so. That being said, if you do have questions for me and you need some help and you're like, I don't have anyone else to ask, <laughs> there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Um, one, if you wanna send me an email, I'm happy to help with questions that only take, you know, maybe 
two minutes to answer. Um, I say that because my inbox, I guess, my email mix <laughs> and my DMs and everything, you know, it's kind of a sacred space. It's my space and I have to do only what I'm able to do. So if I'm answering, you know, taking an hour every day to answer knitting questions, that's taking away from time that I can be doing things that I need to do in order to provide for my family. And I know that's very like, wow, Natalie, <laughs> but that's just the truth that there's things that need my attention that I need to get done because I have a family to provide for. Um, so I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, if you have something quick, if you want to send me an email, natalie at nittynatty.com or point you in the right direction. Sometimes I might just say, hey, check this out um, or whatever. I'm happy to do that. If you have more in-depth questions or you need some pattern help, I'm also um, doing private lessons still and I'm doing drop-in classes. So that's all on nittynatty.com. I have those on Wednesdays. Um, and for right now, they're just going to stay on Wednesdays because I don't have um, a lot of lessons booking up. If that starts to get full, then I might start going to other days of the week too. But I have Wednesday set aside to do lessons um, if you need further help. Um, if you're ever looking for like a project, just go to my Ravelry project page. You can search at the top if you're looking for something specific. Um, what else? I don't know. I, I don't want you to feel like because the Ask Me thread is gone, that you are totally abandoned. I'm still here to help, I promise. Um, but we're moving on to other things, and who knows, Ask Me may come back in the future. Okay, I think that's everything, and let's it's time to actually get into these questions. But I did wanna say, normally when I'm answering them on the podcast, <laughs> I'm scrolling to the top, I will read your entire, everything that you put in the Ravelry post. But since I'm answering a bunch of questions today, I have taken away parts of it that are not the question. So if you're like, hey, Natalie, I love your podcast. Like I took that out today. So I don't want you to think as a viewer, like, wow, these people are just so direct and to the point. They don't even say like, thank you or anything. They did. I just cut all of that out this time because I want to answer the questions and get through all of them in a semi-concise way, <laughs> sort of. You know, I like to go on about things. So without further ado, here we go into the final Ask Me segment of Nitty Natty for now to be continued. <laughs> All right, the first question is from um, Val Britton 2. In your recent videos where you are winding yarn, I see that you have a black attachment you put on your Swift. In this week's podcast, you also mentioned clipping the loose end. What do you use? Did it come with your Swift? If it did, what else could be used with, or what else could one use with an Amish Swift? That's a great question. So I think what you're talking about, I did not bring my whole Swift over here, but I did bring this. I have an Amish Swift. It is from Fiber Artist Supply Co. And in the Swift, there are pegs, there's holes and pegs and you put the pegs in and they're like, you know, spread out so that you can put your hang of yarn on there and then use your ball winder. So what will happen is you have two ends on the skein of yarn, one that's feeding into the ball winder and actually winding your cake of yarn and the other one that is just left there. And what will happen with the other one is it will sometimes, most of the time, get wound around the bottom of the Swift. This is extremely frustrating and you have to stop and unwind it and it's horrible. So. What I will do is on whichever peg is closest to that other end, I will use this thing, okay? So this is something my friend Rebecca, you have met her if you've watched our Rhinebeck videos, my friend Rebecca made, made for me, Rebecca, Rebecca <laughs> made for me. It is like really thick foam. The bottom has a hole in it that I can put on the peg like that. And the top of it is just like, split like, I don't know, a quarter of an inch down. It's just like split the whole way so that you can feed the yarn through there. And what this does is the end that's not feeding into your ball, your ball winder, it holds onto it. I usually do it back and forth like twice and then smush it into there. So that holds on to your yarn. Now, before I had this, before Rebecca made that, I used a small chip clip. So same thing, I had my little chip clip, I kept it in this bag, and when 
I found that thing of yarn, I would wrap it, the second, the second strand of yarn, I would wrap it around and then I would chip clip it like this onto there. And that's it. This is the simplest, easiest thing. You can go grab a chip clip. I mean, if you didn't even have that, you could probably use a rubber band, but it helps so much to keep that second end out of your way. It's a game changer, I promise, if you have um, an Amish Swift. We had another yarn winding question, so I wanted to do that one next. Um, I was gifted the Ball Winder and Swift from Fiber Artist Supply Co, Co for Christmas last year, and I'm having a really hard time making cakes that successfully pull from the center. I've tried everything from winding slow, winding fast, changing the tension of my finger that's holding the yarn as it's feeding into the winder, changing the way I start the cake, etc. It always ends up becoming yarn barf, and then I have to wind into a ball by hand from the outside tail. What are your tips for creating a successful center pull cake on your ball winder and swift? This is from Megs897. You know, that you're not the first person that I've heard this from. I've heard this quite a bit actually with this particular ball winder and set. And I think that it's kind of like, like I just wanna say that because I wanna say like, you're not alone. <laughs> and I have a hard time too, not with every cake or not with every yarn, most things are fine. Um, but I've also um, played with it to figure it out. So here are some of the things that help me. But again, even still, I still have some yarns that like I have to try winding them like five times and it's so frustrating. So I totally get it. Okay, most importantly, with this type of Amish Swift and Ball Winder, you need them to be on the same level. This is very important. So if you have like a big dining table or a kitchen island, ideally you would put them, set them both there and they would be on the same level. This is gonna make things much, much easier. I don't have that kind of like surface area in my house. So that's why I sit on the floor to wind <laughs> and it does help a lot. Um, so have them on the same level, that helps a ton. The second thing is I hold my yarn while it's feeding through. I don't just let the tension come off of the ball winder be, or off of the Swift because that's not even. So I kind of hold it a little bit. I probably need to do a video on this because I actually, like I said, people will ask this all the time. Um, I kind of hold on to it loosely and let it feed through my fingers because that way if something happens on the Swift, I'm keeping the tension pretty even here. Um, I think that the reason that there's yarn barf is there's, uh, there's like, sometimes the tension's tighter, looser, and it just changes. And that can be really hard to control um, if your Swift and Ball Winder are not on the same level, or if you're not holding on to it. It sounds like you are doing that, so that's really, really good. Um, the one other thing that can happen with slippery yarns, this would not be every yarn, is that your actual, cake of yarn on the shaft of the um, ball winder can slide. So what you can do here, they actually make these like, you know how there's like that rubber, black rubber like O-ring around the ball winder and like the gears that turn it? They make them that go on the shaft of the ball winder and you put it on first before you start winding your yarn. That way your cake of yarn doesn't slide. I believe Fiber Artist Supply Co sells them, but you can also just use a rubber band and you put it straight on the shaft of the yarn and it keeps your ball of yarn from moving up and down. That, if you notice, like sometimes you're winding and all of a sudden like your yarn stops going around the outside of the cake and like goes around the top or the bottom of your cake, like just around the shaft. They're really super annoying. Um, so those are a few things that can help. I think anything else I might have to like do a video on and show it to you. So maybe I can include that in Vlogmas this year because I'm gonna be winding stuff up anyway to get prepared. Um, but try those things and see if they will help. Next question is from Karen's Adventures. When you're making socks for other people, where do you measure on their foot and how do you use those measurements to tell what size to knit? I'm going to be making some socks for a friend who doesn't live in the same city. It's not a surprise, so I can ask her for measurements, but I won't be able to get to her to try them on as I go. Okay, so there's a couple different things that you can do. There are charts, um, if you just like Google like 
hand knit sock size chart um, that can help you if you know the person's shoe size, you can kind of see like the different measurements. So that's super helpful. Um, if you want to ask your friend to measure, what I would suggest is having your friend like stand on a piece of cardboard or a piece of paper to trace their foot. And then they can measure across, like they can measure from their longest toe to the back of their heel on that outline. And then they can also measure across the widest part of their foot, which is probably the ball of their foot. Um, and then if you're going to make the socks like sort of high, you might want to have them measure their calf. This is going to give you really good, um, indication on how many stitches you need to cast on depending on your gauge. Um, and then of course, once you know your stitches per inch, which you can find another sock you've knit and measure that, you can just multiply. So for me, I think my feet, the ball of my foot is, um, I guess it would be like three and a half inches across. So I'll double that because I want the sock to go around my whole foot. So I need a seven inch um, circumference. It might be a little wider than that because you want to take off some for negative ease. So basically I'm aiming to make my socks seven inches around and I know that my sock gauge is eight stitches per inch. Then I can just do seven times eight, which is what? 56. Um, I've actually started knitting my socks with 56 stitches instead of 60 and it's been much better now that I know that. <laughs> um, so that's, a, that's one way to like just get all that figured out. Um, I'm doing a lot more research um, right now just with my own socks, but then I'm also gonna be doing it with some other people's socks and then having people help me. And then eventually I'm gonna be hopefully teaching a class on this so that you can make your own custom fit socks. So stay tuned for that. Hopefully it's coming in the future. And again, if you just want like, if that's too much to do all the math um, and have your friend measure, then you can refer to one of those size charts and that will give you a really great place to start. Next question is from Lauren Byers. Can you block knits as you're knitting? I have a 100% wool shawl I'm knitting for a present and I want to make sure I don't make it too big. Can I wet block this while it's still on the needles and then resume knitting the project if I need it bigger? Okay, you can definitely block things while you're still knitting on them, but there's a specific way you'll want to do it. So recently I blocked something while I was not done knitting it, my Lume sweater, my colorwork sweater that I did for Rhinebeck because I ran out of yarn and I was waiting for Rebecca to come up from Texas to New York City and bring the extra yarn that she had, but I still had live sleeve stitches. Um, and then somebody suggested, hey, Natalie, you should totally block it so that at least the majority of it's blocked and then you can finish knitting the sleeve. Anyway, there's like a whole deadline thing involved. And I've done this with other stuff too, though I can't think of a specific example of why I had to do this. Um, so there's a couple things you can do. One, instead of wet blocking, if you have a steamer, you could steam block it. That way you don't have to take your knitting off the needles. Um, because number one is we don't want to put the knitting needles into the water um, for wet blocking. Even wooden, well, okay, you don't want to get wood like soaking wet anyway, but like all needles, no matter what, have like that metal portion of them and we don't want that soaking in there with our yarn. It's just not a good idea. Um, so you could steam block it and not have to take it off the needles or you could completely uh, take it off the needles by threading another string of yarn through all of your live stitches and tie and closing that, like tying it together. That this is what I did for my sleeve stitches. I put, um, another thing of yarn all the way through and I did not use wool. I can't, I think I used like a, maybe I did use wool cause that's pretty much all I have, but I used something that had some nylon in it cause I didn't want it to like fuse together with a yarn. I used a contrast and I put it through all those stitches tied it off so that nothing would come undone. And then I was able to wet block the whole thing. Um, so you can do that. Did you say it was lace? No, you just said wool shawl. Um, it might be a little tricky if it's lace or something because it will be trickier to get your stitches back on the needles. Um, but it would be worth it so that you don't knit something that's way too big. So those are the two ways I know you can steam block or you can put all of your live stitches onto another yarn and then wet block it completely. That will give you the most accurate picture of how big your shawl is going to be. Next question is from Poppers11. I'm currently knitting the Suburban Wrap by Hoey Locatelli and I'm having issues with the color changes, which I also have when attempting to knit 
striped socks. Any tips or advice for help with this as the side I start the color change or help with this as the side I start the color changes, especially on the stripes, is bunched up. I know this should be looser, but not exactly sure how to do this correctly. So when you're carrying yarns for color change on the side of anything, if it's socks, a shawl, a sweater, it doesn't matter, you have to be very careful to leave enough yarn to match the rows of knitting that you've done in between. So let's say you're alternating like pink and blue. Here's pink and you need to knit blue again. Blue is down here. When you carry that strand up, you need to kind of like, you know, lay it loosely against your knitting and not pull tight or you're gonna scrunch all those rows that you did in between. There's another tip that I have that alongside leaving a longer length of yarn can really help. It's to add an extra yarn over. I shared this recently. I can't remember if it was in a podcast or something else. Basically on the right side, or if you're knitting in the round, you're knitting shawls, you're knitting flat. Um, but basically on one row, you add an extra yarn over at that edge. And then on the following row, you just drop that yarn over. Nothing happens because it's not really a stitch. You just drop it and it will elongate your edge stitch. So what that would look like is, let's see, pink and blue example again. You've just finished with pink and now you're bringing up blue. You carry it nice and loose to match all those rows of knitting that you did. And you knit one and then you yarn over. And then you continue with your pattern all the way across or around or whatever. When you come back to that yarn over at that first edge where you change the color, you get to the last two stitches. It should be a yarn over and a regular knit or however you started. You just drop that yarn over off and your edge stitch will go zoop and stretch. This is super, super helpful. Only do it like on the row, you know, you're changing the color on. You don't need to do it for every row of that color. If you have like four or five rows of one color in a row, it helps a ton and it will make your edge so much looser. Even with like with shawls, I think there's always the one side, it's that right hand side that's always tighter for some reason. So you can also do this, even if you're not changing colors, if you're doing like um, increases on one side, you can add in that yarn over and drop it and it'll make your right hand side match the tension on the left. I learned that years ago, it's such a great tip. This question is from CraftyB83. Various podcasts, podcasters mention about alternating skeins when knitting garments. I was wondering if you could explain a bit more about this, please. Is it necessary to alternate skeins on all hand dyed yarn or just a specific type? And why is it necessary? Also, how do you actually do it? Do you alternate 100 gram skeins or do you split each skein into 50 grams and use those two each time? And how does it work when you're coming to the end of a skein and need to change two new ones? Would there be four skeins on the go at that point? And how do you alternate skeins if you're using an odd number of skeins? This is an excellent question. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to answer all of this fully. I will say that alternating skeins is something that's kind of like slightly different depending on each project. So at the most basic level, when you're alternating skeins of yarn, hand dyed yarn, it's because it's hand dyed and it's not gonna be exactly identical. If you've ever seen somebody knit something and they didn't do this, they might have like the top of a sweater that's like a slightly lighter shade and then the bottom of the sweater and there's a super obvious line. Most people don't like that, so they will alternate. Or if they're in the round, they will switch skeins every single row or every other row. And if you're knitting flat, you would do this. You would do a right and a wrong side row, switch to the other skein, right, wrong side row, switch. Because you don't wanna have to cut your yarn every time. So you wanna do it where your yarn is located. Um, so that's the most basic is just you're just alternating every other row or every two rows. There's a few ways to do it. Um, in the if you're doing a project in the round, I would suggest helical knitting. Um, I have a tutorial on that. Just go look it up. It's it's amazing and it makes it so that you don't have to carry your yarns at the beginning of the round and create a very obviously tight um, line. Um, if you are knitting flat, I would definitely use the trick I just shared, which is the yarn over trick to extend that side where you are changing the yarns. It helps a ton. Um, so if you have, let's see, 
When you're knitting a sweater, let's say you have three skeins of yarn. And let's say it's knit from the top down. What I would do is I would start with skein number one. Okay, first actually I would look at all the skeins. And let's say they're all pretty similar, then you can do them in any order, it doesn't matter. Let's say two are light and one is darker, you need to kind of strategize to get that darker one like spread out. So that might be a case where you want to split that darker skein into two so that you can spread it throughout the sweater a little bit better. Um, it's just, it's all very like, project specific and yarn specific. Um, but let's just say you have three skeins that look similar, um, which is an odd number. So you can't just go like skeins one and two, skeins three and four. Um, and you kind of want them all to melt together anyway. So you would start with skein number one. I usually like to do the first few rows just with one skein before I add in the second one. But if you have three, you could probably do like the first few inches with one skein. Then add your second skein in and you're going like every other row for a while, like down to the tummy or whatever. Eventually you're going to run out of skein number one because that's what you started with. You should run out of that first. When you run out of skein number one, you just have two left. They're skein number two. You join in skein number three and alternate those for a while and eventually you're going to run out of skein number three. Now there's all these other like nuances that can happen like when you're doing a raglan uh, sleeve sweater and you've used the first skein or alternated the first two skeins and then you put the stitches on hold, you finish the body, you come back to work on the sleeves and skeins one and two are gone, used up, and you introduce skein number three or four and it's different. So there's all kinds of like things that I'm even still learning like when you split off for the sleeves, um, maybe reserve a little bit of the, the skeins you use for the, the yoke of the sweater so that when you come pick up the sleeves, you can use those original yarns for a little bit and then fade in the new ones. All kinds of different nuances. So I know that might not have answered your question completely, completely, but I hope it gave you <laughs> a little bit to think about and just know that with every project, you kind of have to like look at it and analyze it a little bit differently. But I would say it's not necessary to like split all of your 100 gram skeins into 50 grams. It just, sometimes you might want to do that. <sighs> do y'all hear that ambulance? It's like constant. Constant and all the time. All right, we're doing great here. Question number seven. <laughs> I saw in your sock video how you have your hand knits in the drawer under your bed. I tried doing it in a drawer under my bed, but I, it didn't really work for me. Just wondering how you fold them to make them sit neatly in there. Um, this question was from Muffin70. So I'm not gonna take the camera over and show you right now because it's dark and I don't want to. And toasters, toasters there. So anyway, I have these huge drawers underneath my bed and that's where I keep all of my hand knits and my t-shirts and everything like that. And I keep my knits, this one's actually really sloppy, I should have not just picked that one. I keep my knits folded like so and they sit up in the drawer like this so when I look in the drawer I can see everything from the top. I love folding like this, I've done this since con since before Marie Kondo was popular and I read her book before she had a show, I started doing this and it's a game changer. I do this for all my clothes. So yeah, vertical folds. Um, so I, the way that I fold everything, I do get fold lines in my knit, so I don't really know how to avoid that. But basically what I do is I take the whole thing and I fold it into thirds like that, right? And then I will usually fold um, from here when it's a long thing. Sometimes I will do thirds again, but oftentimes because they're long enough, I will do half and then half again, like, like that. And that's how they sit in my drawer like this. Now, the other thing that I find so necessary to keep everything super nice is I have these, um, I guess they're called, just called like drawer, drawer organizers. I got them at the container store, but they are these tension, like plastic acrylic things that go in between um, the rows of my sweaters. So basically I'll have like one row of sweaters 
and then I'll have like the divider, divider, that's what it's called. And then I'll have like all my shawls and then another divider and that keeps them all stacked up neatly. So that helps a ton so that when you don't like pull one out, like everything falls all to the wayside. So I'll try to remember to link those as well. This question is, oh, actually that was a duplicate. So maybe we don't have 17 questions. Okay, this one is from Baby Moo Cow. I enjoyed hearing about your Rhinebeck experience. I wanted to ask if it caters mostly to knitters rather than crocheters. Did you see many crochet patterns or samples while you were there? Okay, I have to be honest, I am a knitter first and foremost. I do crochet, I love crochet, but I was honestly not looking at for crochet stuff specifically, and I feel like that's probably skewed my memory of what it, of what it was because that's not the lens that I was looking at Rhinebeck through. I will say there's definitely more knitting there. Like that I can say with confidence, um, and there's probably more knitters there, but I do believe there was crochet things and crochet samples. And so I don't want anyone who is a crocheter or like, I feel like I'm a capital K knitter. If you're like, I'm a capital C crocheter, I know how to knit, but I love crocheting. I don't want you to feel like you shouldn't go to things like Rhinebeck because we need more people. We need more crocheters going to those events and putting snotty knitters in their places. <laughs> and saying like crochet is cool, crocheters use hand dyed yarn, crocheters make beautiful garments, um, beautiful shawls, beautiful items, um, because I feel like that can be a huge um, divide in the yarn community. And it's just, it's so silly and so untrue. Um, so I, I will be honest and say my lens was knitting. I was looking at knitting stuff. I was looking at yarn, thinking about knitting projects. So I probably missed a lot of the crochet stuff. Um, it probably was a more knitter heavy event, but don't let that stop you. I did see people wearing crochet garments. I do remember that. Um, and then of course, one of the Kate was there with her crew all wearing uh, these amazing crocheted pineapple crowns. They were awesome. So it is, I think it's becoming more, um, it's not balanced yet, but there's definitely more crocheters showing up at those big events that are have been traditionally knitters. And I, I want to see that continue to happen. Okay, next question is from You So Fuzzy. That's <laughs> so cute. I was just wondering, who are your favorite designers, makers, dyers to follow on Instagram? How do you find new people you want to follow? Um, okay, so I'm gonna cop out here a little bit and I'm not gonna tell you my favorites because um, I, ha I definitely have people that I like love and what, and like, go to all the time for certain things. Um, but if I try to list them, I will leave out somebody else that I love. <laughs> so I'm not gonna do that. Um, and I definitely go in waves too with like working a lot with one particular dyer or pattern designer and then, you know, going into another phase where I'm working with another one a lot. So it ebbs and flows. Um, but I do wanna share how I find new people to follow and, you know, explore and stuff like that. So I spend most of my time on Instagram and stories. That's my favorite place to be. I don't know if that's how it is for you or not, um, but I spend most of my time in stories. So I will watch stories. And then when somebody like shares um, another dyer or shares another designer, I will like click on that post and go to their thing and be like, oh, do I like their stuff? Whatever, do I wanna follow them? And then I might start following them. Um, so it is so helpful if you do like certain designers, dyers, people who make progress keepers, people who make bags, if you share their stuff to your feed by sharing like the actual photo or whatever, you know, reel, whatever they have and tagging them, um, I think people see that. That's how I find out about new people. Um, I see that. So that's how I will find new people. Um, I don't really go on like the explore page, although I used to um, more often, but yeah, usually that's what I do. And also I know people don't like this, but Instagram will put like other people you might want to follow like in between as you scroll in your feed. And I will go to that too. 
Like I actually look at those. <laughs> I'm like, do I want to follow them? So that's how I find people. This next question, it's a juicy one. <laughs> this is from um, Lore Creations. Where's the best place to put short rows for a yoked colorwork sweater? I'm flexible on doing it top down or bottom up. I need to add at least two to three inches of short rows to most patterns, since most sweater patterns do not include enough short rows for me. Between the body, or sorry, between the body and the beginning of the color work, between the color work and the collar, or should I just suck it up and add the short rows in between the color work and collar, but keeping with an within an extended version of the color work pattern? I would have to redesign the color work there since it's obviously not my pattern. Okay, if you are confused, I will just tell you that this question is above, <laughs> is above me. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the answer to this question. Um, all I can share with you is what I've done in patterns in the past with yoked sweaters. So the issue with a yoke sweater is that it is, well, I guess raglan is too, but basically like sweaters are funny because they are the same circumference all the way around. But we know as women, or not even as women, as people, some of our bodies are not circular. <laughs> like the, the topography in the front does not match the back. And so it is just like not, it's a weird way to like make clothing items, right? So short rows can really help with that. Now where I've done short rows in the past mostly is at the back of the neck. And the, this just adds a little more fabric so that the yoke like drops. It, it gives it like a wider plane on the back so that it like, I don't know, situates better. And then it also gives you a little more length in the back too. So I am so sorry. I do not know the answer to this question like in the slightest, but where I've done short rows for yoked sweaters, color work yoked sweaters, is right at the beginning before the color work or the pattern starts at the center back of the neck and probably about out to right here. And that's it. Not more than an inch and a half or two inches, I would say. Probably an inch and a half. Um, so if anyone has any more information, please add to the comments of this video and help us out. Man, toaster's being loud, Kent's being loud. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Um, this is from hlandy01. I go through phases of being good about stretches and breaks and phases of not doing either. I found that if I knit a lot over time, I feel like my grip gets weaker. I've been thinking about ordering a grip strengthener to try to counteract this. Have you experienced this as well? And if so, have you tried using a grip strengthener to alleviate it? So before I answer this question, disclaimer that I am not a doctor, I have no medical training, and I have literally no idea what I'm talking about except for my own experience. Okay, this is what I think is happening because this happens to me too. When you're knitting a lot, you are using all these muscles, tendons, whatnot, whatever, in your arms with repetitive motion, repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. What happens is, if you're overusing them or if you're using them incorrectly, like out of alignment, you are straining them. You're overdoing it and your arms need a break. Your arms and your hands need a break. If you're noticing that your grip is getting weak, I don't think that's because you're not strong enough. I think that's because you've overdone it. So this is literally, because I've experienced this too. If I've done too much knitting, I will try to pick up a cup like this and I feel like I can't hold on to it. That's a problem. That means you're, you're knitting way too much. You've got to take a break. It's not because your grip is not strong enough. It's because you've overdone it. Again, I'm not a doctor, so you should probably go to your doctor and see, but that's what I've noticed has happened with me. So I would probably err on not getting a, dr a grip strengthener because I don't think strength is the issue. I think it's like, you're, it's like a rubber band, like you've worn it out. You're not going to make that stronger except with rest. So I would rest, I would knit less, I would take more breaks, I would do more stretches. I found that when I do yoga, because you're doing like weight bearing stuff, I 
have a much easier time doing more knitting. I think it like counteracts, it does strengthen, like that's important too, but I think it counteracts all the tension that you have like this. <laughs> Um, so do that, do your stretches, make sure you're switching projects around. Um, but if you're really having a problem, like picking stuff up or gripping things, like I would have a hard time opening jars, stop, stop for a while, go to the doctor, see what they say, because I would, I would think that it was an overuse injury. So one more disclaimer. I'm not a doctor. We've got another quick, fun question from hlandy one um, as we enter the festive holiday season, you have so many themed progress keepers. Since you put them on earring backs, do you ever um, clean them and wear them as festive holiday earrings? That would be so cute. Okay, that's a really fun question. So I have this entire bowl right here full of progress keepers. And I put my progress keepers on earring backs because I find it way easier to open them. Um, I don't like the lobster claws because I have to like ruin my nails to get the clip open. Whereas these, I can take my two hands and open up like that, right? So they're earring backs. So technically I could put them through my ears and wear them, um, but I never have. <laughs> I totally could. I guess what would keep me from doing that is a couple of things. One, I don't have any that match. They're all completely unique. So I would be wearing two different ones, which I guess would be fine because they're already kind of cheesy anyway. Um, two, I always wear studs because um, this, actually my right earlobe, my uh, piercing is torn. So if I wear dangly earrings, I mean, those are really light, so it probably wouldn't be a problem, but when I wear dangle earrings, this one would hang lower because this is torn from sleeping in my earrings. Because when I would sleep, the earring would get pushed down and now this one is torn and you can't really do anything about that. Um, so don't sleep in your earrings. Um, and then, I guess the third reason is just because I don't buy high quality <laughs> earring backs and I have really sensitive skin. So I think that would be a problem. So that's me being such a Debbie Downer. Oh my gosh. But that would be, I think that'd be really fun. Um, and I don't honestly wearing mismatched ones would be completely adorable. So maybe I will have to do that. Maybe I'll do that for our sock mist cast on party. That would be really fun. Next question is from Lolly Lou. I'm kind of new around here, so I'm not sure if you've covered this before. What are your preferred knitting needles? Maybe a knitting needle review of what you like and don't like. I'm looking for a nice interchangeable set to ask Santa for. Also a pretty way to store them all together. So I do, I think I did a video of my favorites last year. I'll have to see if I can find that. Um, recently I did a knitting needle organization video, so I can definitely link that. All of my knitting needles are in here. Um, so I use two different needles mainly. I use Chai Goo Red Lace for sock knitting and anything that's um, size two or size three. And for everything else, I have been using, this is Erin uh, Light Bags, by the way, this little holder. I have been using Knit Picks Interchangeable wooden needles for over 10 years. Um, they also make metal and plastic. I think they still make plastic. They definitely still make the wood. I think they are, oh shoot, what size was this? <laughs> I just pulled it out and I don't know. That's why I keep a needle gauge in here. So let's see, size six, okay. Um, so I love these needles. I think they're absolutely fantastic and they are a marvelous price. I think they're like $60, $70. You can always wait for a sale, um, but that's a really, really good price when you consider that a single fixed needle, most of the time is $10 or more. And in the kit you're getting, um, I think it's two cord sizes and all the needle tips. It's like, saves you so much money. So I would ask for that. Plus mine have lasted me for 10 years. So <laughs> I think they're absolutely fantastic. Um, next question is from Kay Plummer. I have made many socks, but always top down. So I'm wanting to try a toe up sock and have purchased the fish lips kiss heel pattern. People are mentioning your sock tutorials. So I was wondering where to find them. 
So I have several sock tutorials that are available on YouTube, absolutely free. I've got a whole series for cuff down socks and a whole series for toe up socks. Both of these include a, an afterthought heel. Um, I've got the afterthought heel with waist yarn that I did originally. And I also have another tutorial for an afterthought heel without waist yarn. I do not have a tutorial on YouTube for the Fish Lips Kiss Heel, but I have been teaching classes. I did a class back during Sock Week, and I'm actually teaching one tomorrow. Um, but as of right now, the Fish Lips Kiss Heel class is not available for purchase. Um, but when I do my whole sock class in the future, I'm hoping to have the entire sock, all of it, the custom fit sock with the fish lips kiss heel and everything all in one um, course that you can purchase and have for as long as you need or forever actually, <laughs> um, and use that so that you have all the sock information in one place. So tutorials are on YouTube and the fish lips kiss heel is just as a paid class. This question is from Nausicaa A. I am knitting the Dobby's Christmas socks and decided to add the color work afterwards by duplicate stitching. I'm not sure whether I should wash and block the finished socks before adding the patterns or afterwards or both. Can you help me? Yes. Okay. So this person is adding names to the top of the stockings with duplicate stitch. This is the best way to add it. Knitting it in is just it just doesn't look the same. So I would suggest going ahead. Well, okay, actually, if you're using acrylic yarn, it doesn't matter. You really don't need to block it. You can just go ahead and do your um, duplicate stitching. If you're using a wool yarn, I would recommend blocking it because blocking will relax your stitches, let them stretch out. And when you're doing duplicate stitch, you want to make sure you're matching the tension of your stitches. So if you duplicate stitch before you block, you're going to match the tension of your you know, tighter knit stitches. Um, and then when you block it, it's just not gonna look as nice. So I would suggest blocking the stocking and then doing your duplicate stitch. Once you've done that, you can see if you do need any blocking. Um, you might not, it might be fine, or you might wanna just steam over it, or you might wanna go ahead and reblock the whole thing. So I would either do just before or before and after. I think that's gonna help you get a nice even look. This is the last question from Miss Mysticia. Um, what do you do with small leftovers, yarn leftovers? And what other suggestions do you have to do with it besides what you do? Do you guys know what I do with my small leftovers? <laughs> I throw them away. Okay, so when I finish a project, I have kind of like a chain of command, if you will, a chain of events that happen with my leftover yarn. If I have like 50 grams or more, a lot of times I just put it back into my yarn stash. Um, if I, or sometimes I will split it off into like 20 grams and 20 grams and like set aside some to give away and set aside some to keep for scrappy projects. If it's less than 50 grams, I will put it into my pouch, my big project bag that I have for my scrappy granny stripe blanket. All of these are projects that I have on Ravelry. I have my scrappy granny stripe blanket. I have a mitered square blanket that I haven't worked on in forever. Um, so I will do those different things. Um, if I'm ever needing a contrast color for a sock, um, I will go into that kind of like stash and look. Um, but once I get down to like really small leftovers, like five grams or less, um, actually, I guess I'm still setting those aside for my miter square. Let's say I've done all that. I've set aside yarn for all my scrappy projects and I still have leftover yarn. I just throw it away. I am not, I cannot be worried about that much of the yarn. And I know for a lot of people that like, oh, they're like, oh my gosh, it's wasteful. Or like, it's so privileged to be able to throw that away. But honestly, guys, don't beat yourself up over like three yards of yarn. Like it's okay. You've used a lot of it. So please don't beat yourself up for that. Um, I know people will do a lot of different things with it though. We get a ton of wonderful suggestions if you do want to hang on to it or use it for something, if that makes you feel good. Um, so there is where I can't remember where we put all these suggestions. It might have been in a podcast in the comments, but let me see if I can think of a few. So I know some people have said you can send 
your like small, small scraps, like, you know, a few yards, you can send them to Hedgehog Fibers and she actually makes a yarn with like the scraps of them. Um, for me, I think that's way too much to ask for me to pay to ship my leftovers to Ireland. So I'm not doing that, <laughs> but that's up to you. Maybe your shop does it, your local yarn shop. So that would be a perfect thing to do. Um, People have said that they love to make those glass Christmas ornaments. This is actually really pretty. So you get a glass Christmas ornament and you stuff all your ends in it for the year. Some people will do it by year, right? And write like 2021 and you have all your little ends. Um, like this is not even scraps. This is like ends of yarn, all of them in there. And it makes a really pretty Christmas ornament, super colorful. I love that. Um, some people just have like something else that's clear glass. A container that they just stuff them all in. I know we used to at Bliss Yarns, we did, we collected them like at the center of the table that everyone was working around and somebody was making bird's nests out of them. I don't know how particularly safe that is. Like you would put them out for birds and they would get them and make their nests. So I can't speak to the nature, like if that's environmentally friendly or good for birds or not, but I know that I've seen people do that. What else? Um, really small ends. I mean, there's always tiny, tiny scrappy projects that you can do. Um, I can't think of anything else right now. But again, if you have suggestions for this, please leave them down below. If you are somebody who wants to use up all of your yarn, do it. And if you're somebody who doesn't, please don't feel guilty about throwing something away. It's, it's okay, I promise you. I promise you. Um, okay, that was all of our questions. So officially the Ask Me thread is closed. We're gonna be doing something else for the podcast and I will be sharing that with you next week. We should have two videos next week. I have something planned to film on Friday that's gonna be fun and great and get us in the mood for this upcoming season. So I'm really excited about that. Um, don't forget, you can still ask me questions by email or set up a lesson with me. I would love to help you. Um, just, just don't ask me on Instagram because I might not get back to you and then I'm going to feel bad. <laughs> All right, everyone have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you in the next one. Bye.